Thank you. Thank you very, very much for that wonderful introduction. Uh, actually, I, I fear we're going to be hard pushed to keep up with these, these beautiful uh, images of deities and avatars and so on. Uh, my name is Caleb Scharf, and I am one of the founders of Y House, and we're absolutely delighted to be here and thank the Rubin Museum for allowing us to work with them to bring you what is, I think, a very unusual and special and wonderful event tonight. Y House is a new nonprofit institute here in New York, founded by a number of us here in the audience. We come from Columbia University, we come from Princeton University, the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton and elsewhere. Y House is devoted to the study of the origins and nature of awareness and consciousness. Everything from protocognition in bacteria to neuroscience to the emergence of ideas and consciences in societies to AI and more, and also including philosophy and contemplation. It's very, very exciting. Things are moving very fast for us, and we hope to be able to engage many more audiences in this type of event. Uh, for us, it is an incredibly important part of doing science and of, of studying these deep questions to have a dialogue with not just ourselves as scientists and thinkers, but with everyone. It's <laughs> tremendously important. So this evening uh, is going to be an interesting, different type of event. It really comes in three acts, and I will just start by introducing the first act and then tell you about the, the second two acts after we've listened to the presentation by Hod Lipson. Hod Lipson is a professor in engineering at Columbia University where he is head of the Creative Machines Lab. And in the Creative Machines Lab, there are all sorts of wondrous robotic goings on. Uh, Hod is known for the, the building of self-aware, self-replicating robots. Uh, he is extremely well known in terms of his uh, public uh, engagement in talking about these exciting fields. He gave a TED talk, the video of which has been viewed more than a million times. And uh, in his copious spare time, he also co-authors books. And I actually have to just read the titles. Tim talked about Driverless, which is Intelligent Cars and the Road Ahead. And he has also co-authored uh, the award-winning book Fabricated, the new world of 3D printing. So between 3D printing and driverless cars, there are two of the most iconic things that are happening in technology right now. And so I'm now gonna hand over to Hod Lipson, if you would be nice enough to give him a warm welcome, who will tell us about AIs and avatars. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Today, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about uh, artificial intelligence and robotics. And uh, you know, I've been in this field for for about 20 years, doing research, teaching. And one of the things that I've noticed is that uh, it's it, it, it's moving so fast that it's surprising even people in the field. So even researchers in the field of AI are being surprised by the rate of progress. In fact, entire entire uh, sub subdomain subfields in robotics and AI are being made obsolete by their own, by their own progress. So it's, it's moving so fast. And I want to give you a little bit of a taste of where things are going, where they've been, some of the struggles that AI has had in the past, and give you a taste of where things are going in the future. And I don't want to talk too much about uh, sort of a, a breathless tour of accomplishments, but more sort of what are the underlying trends that are driving this and sort of help us understand the long-term end game of artificial intelligence. So, you know, most of us uh, start off thinking about artificial intelligence in the form of, uh, uh, you know, we get exposed to AI as, uh, as robots and uh, in, in uh, I'll just point this in my direction. There, so, uh, so usually we think about AI as, uh, most of us have been exposed to it as Hollywood, uh, depending on when you started watching sci-fi movies, you might d see AI in different ways. Sometimes they're happy robots, sometimes they're sad robots, sometimes uh, their relationship is more complex. But obviously, we're, we've been dreaming about AI and robotics for a long time, but in reality, we haven't seen anything even close to that. Most AI today is behind the scenes. It's working in doing very sophisticated things, but it's doing things in, in sort of very protected worlds where there's 
very nice tabulated data. It can handle sort of uncertainties uh, and uh, consequences of mispredictions are not that grave. So we're seeing a lot of uh, AI and machine learning being used uh, in uh, analytics in, uh, in, uh, in Wall Street. And I know there's a lot of people here engaged in that. We're seeing AI doing predictions of the weather. But if you get it wrong once uh, in a while, uh, predicting the weather, it's not the end of the world. We see AI predicting what song we're going to play next and what thing we're going to buy and what web link we're going to click on. So a lot of AI behind the scene doing all of this sort of analytics uh, and so forth. But uh, something has happened in the last couple of years, maybe in the last two or three years, where we're seeing this sudden exponential almost growth in artificial intelligence, in interest in this field. So if you look at investments, for example, in the field of artificial intelligence, you see sort of an inflection point around 2012, 2013, where suddenly a lot of interest is flowing into this field. So what's happening? This is 2014, 2015, more, 2016, even more. There's something going on in the field of AI that is not business as usual. I want to tell you what's happening. This is a talk that I could not give just two, three years ago. This is not sort of business as usual. AI is getting faster, cheaper, and better. No, there's something else happening in this field that spells a new era for humanity. I want to talk a little bit about that. We're also seeing more investments, more companies being formed, larger investments, every company. So at least from the financial point of view, there's certainly something interesting going on. So Mark Andreessen, founder of Netscape, if you remember uh, that, uh, once said, famously said, software is eating the world. In other words, wherever, Whatever industry software uh, uh, enters, that industry changes and never looks back. And software is worming its way into every area. And one message I want you to take home today is that AI is eating software. In other words, wherever there is software, AI soon follows and changes that software, and we never look back. And this is sort of the trend that we're seeing happen in almost any area. So, we're used to seeing AI already sort of uh, in these kind of public demonstrations. Uh, IBM Watson uh, famously winning Game of Jeopardy. Uh, more recently, a couple of months ago, AlphaGo beating uh, the world champion in the game of Go, which is, uh, if you're not familiar with that game, it's the hardest, the most difficult board game invented by man. For many years, people in the AI community thought that it would never be possible for a software program to beat a human because the strategy is so complex and the possibilities are so infinite that it's almost impossible for a computer to sort of sort through these. But it turns out a computer could be uh, the best uh, human in this game just a couple of months ago. Uh, we're seeing also robots moving from the virtual world into the physical world, into embodied physical robots that can walk around and do things that nobody thought could be done before. We're seeing robots uh, roam around department stores not in New York, but in the rest of the planet, talking to people and having conversations. We're even seeing new kinds of, uh, new kinds of uh, cashier-free department store where the AI just sees what you take off the shelf and charges you. So incredible, lots of incredible applications are, are, are happening. Uh, and uh, driverless cars is sort of uh, my favorite uh, example, and I'll, I'll, I'll keep showing this as, a, as, as an example of AI, not because I like cars, but because it's maybe the first example of a fully autonomous robot that we will all interact with on a daily basis. We all thought maybe one day we'll have a butler or something like that, but really the first autonomous robot we'll all interact with on a daily basis and trust our life with, to is going to be a driverless car, and it's the sort of first incarnation of this AI worming its way into our daily life in the physical world. So why is all this happening now? So there's this inflection point, a lot of interest. What is happening now? So uh, it's, uh, it's tempting to look at sort of these Moore's Law exponential curves and, that, and, and say, OK, computers are getting faster, cheaper, and better at an exponential rate. They're doubling their price performance every so many months. Artificial intelligence, like other software technologies, is riding this exponential curve and it's also getting faster, cheaper, and better. So that's true to some extent, but there's something else happening beyond this curve. So this is at the basis, and we call it the, the, this sort of law of, of returns of, of software, but that's only the beginning of the story. 
There's a lot more happening in robotics and AI that is making uh, it take off. There's a lot of technological improvements like much better batteries and more efficient components that allow robots to roam around in ways they couldn't before. But really the, the most important thing that is happening in AI is a change in the paradigm of how we think of, to design artificial intelligence tools. You see, for most of the AI history, which started sort of in the 40s, People thought that uh, uh, the, there were sort of these two paradigms that, that, uh, that competed, uh, two paradigms that competed in academia and competed in industry, two different ways, two schools of thought of how you might build an intelligent systems. One of them, when I'm showing the, a scene for the imitation game, uh, showing the first computer, of course, the, the first uh, computer, you know, there's no photos of it. Uh, but the first idea was that you build a computer by programming the computer, by writing rules, and the computer sort of searches and solves and, and looks and, and, and uses logic to work through these instructions to solve a problem. So that's the analytical way of building artificial intelligence. The second approach, invented more or less at the same time, is called machine learning. It's the idea that you don't program the computer, you show it examples. And the computer learns from these examples, very much like the same way you teach a child. You don't program a child, you show the child examples and you hope that the child learns from your examples. And so uh, this idea was uh, there for a long time, uh, but uh, in fact, uh, when we talk about perception, which is the topic of the series, uh, some of the uh, early examples of machine learning were used to do perception. This is one of the first computers in 1957, had a primitive uh, camera, 20 by 10, 20 pixels, and it could look at a shape and determine if it's a square, a triangle, or a circle, but it did that because it's seen examples and it learned, not by, because somebody programmed it. So that was a, a big accomplishment back in the 50s, it was celebrated uh, by media as sort of uh, the age of AI, but it turned out that this never took off because there wasn't enough data to train those systems. And you think about it, back in the 50s, how many digital images could you find back in the 50s to train a system like that? So this approach never took off. Instead, the analytical approach of programming computer became the dominant approach. And uh, the idea there is that you program computers by writing if-then-else kind of uh, rules, and the computer sorts through these rules and uses these rules to find the optimal uh, solution. So uh, that still works today for lots of different applications. For example, if you are uh, finding, looking to find the shortest path from A to B, there's a very good algorithm for that that somebody developed. And it works and it, it's very logical, it, it's fast, it, it's suitable for the, for the slow and memory limited computers of the 50s. Uh, but uh, it's, good, it's also good enough if you want to play checkers or chess or some, some kind of uh, AI challenge that's well defined that involves logic and parsing rules and so forth. But it doesn't work for real life. And when people try to take these very sophisticated programs and put them on a, on a robot that would drive uh, in the open roads, and this is one of the first driverless cars back in the 70s in Stanford, it turned out that no, not even the best developers could write software that would keep this thing driving and staying on the road. Nobody could take the video camera feed and determine what's drivable and what's not. A very simple task that any child riding a bicycle can do. Uh, no amount of programming would allow anybody to get this thing, uh, to keep it on the road. So, so real life is much harder than playing chess and even playing Go. It's really, really, there's a lot of options and things that you can do. And the computer, nobody can write any rules for it. And this is where sort of that paradigm began to, to break down and maybe the culmination of that, sort of my own experience was DARPA Grand Challenge. This was a big competition in 2004, where DARPA said, Dar uh, defense uh, uh, agency said, uh, we're gonna give a million dollars to whoever can make a, a car drive across the desert, 150 miles with nobody inside. Uh, not a, a, a human waiting to take over wheel, nobody inside. Just hit enter and let the car drive 150 miles and the roads look like this. So uh, it's a pretty challenging task. Uh, lots of people signed up. Uh, big companies, small companies, corporations, universities, hackers all over the world signed up. They all lined up their cars. They all hit enter 
and nobody went further than seven miles. Um, next year, for some, because of some glitch uh, with Congress, the money was, the pot was still there, it doubled over that year, it became $2 million. And DARPA said, okay, let's try that again. This time, people were a bit savvier, they, they practiced a little bit more, but nobody again knew where the competition is gonna be, so you couldn't actually practice this and beforehand. Uh, I was at Cornell University at the time. Uh, our team submitted uh, uh, our, uh, we, we sort of had uh, a car show up there, and uh, you know, the best students program day and night to write down all kinds of rules that would determine, tell the car how to drive, how to determine what's drivable and what's not drivable. Uh, it turned out uh, that our car ended up hitting a roadblock when it reached a, uh, an overpass over the road. We didn't anticipate there being an overpass. The car reached that overpass and saw a big thing towering over the road. It thought it's a big obstacle. It didn't know what to do. In other words, we used the old paradigm and those rules couldn't account for reality. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a few other cars were able to complete the race. Uh, one of them is a Stanford car called Stanley. And uh, the head of that team famously said the following. When asked how they managed to solve that dire pro problem of programming the rules to drive a car, he said, in the end, we started relying on what we call machine learning or big data. That is, instead of trying to program all these rules by hand, we taught a robot the same way we would teach a human driver. In other words, they drove around violently in the desert, showing the car by example how to drive. And the car would drive and they would say, good driving, bad driving, good driving, bad driving. It's a little bit like what my wife tells me <laughs> when I'm driving around. And that feedback allowed the car to get better and better at driving, it was learning through machine learning, not through rules. And that was sort of the breakthrough uh, that allowed this thing to take off. So uh, when it comes to machine learning, uh, which is especially important in these sort of perception, outdoor, real world tasks, not playing chess necessarily, uh, we have this combination of data and algorithms, and we, we liken the, the algorithms to the engine and the data to the fuel, and they're both useless on their own, but when you put them together, you can really take off, and this is what is happening now. This is the big transition that we've been waiting for. So there's a lot of curves on the web showing you how data is growing exponentially, not just computing power, data, but this one is my favorite. This one shows the number of cameras sold the last couple of years, up until 2014, and you can see Again, nothing short of an exponential curve, uh, but you can't see the top. Let me zoom out a little bit so you can see what it looks like. This is the number of cameras sold in 2014. If this curve would go to 2016, it would go through the roof. Now, this is just cameras. Remember, cameras are getting faster, higher resolution, higher frame rate. They can upload and communicate faster. So this is generating more and more data, and data is the fuel that's fueling all these algorithms. And it's not just cameras, it's GPS and uh, motion sensors and you name it. But that's not the end of the story. It turns out that if you were a big corporation or a government or university, you always had lots of data and computing power. You had to pay a lot, but you always had that. But still, that wasn't enough. In fact, up until maybe three or four years ago, if you would go to the best programmers on the planet and you would say, can you write a software that can look at a picture and tell me if it's a cat or a dog? Nobody could do that reliably, nobody. Tasks that any child can do, any one-year-old child can tell the difference between a cat and a dog, no software could do something like that reliably. Because nobody could write rules and nobody could even do train machine learning algorithms to do this. It was too complicated even for machine learning and that was sort of a, a challenge that was so grave that eventually uh, a group of uh, machine learning people said, okay, enough of this, let's crowdsource the solution. Enough of all these universities that can't figure it out. We know that data is a big piece of it, so let's give everybody a lot of data, and let's see who can write software to do this. So they created uh, this big repository of images. They had a million images broken down into a, million, into a thousand categories. So there were a thousand images of swans and a thousand images of swords and a thousand images of syringes and a thousand images of spaghetti and a thousand images of a thousand different categories, a million images in total. 
They said, we give you this huge repository, and let's see if anybody can write software that will take in 100,000 new images that haven't been seen before and classify them correctly. So uh, the competition started, uh, 2010 it was. The first uh, batch of submission came in. Big companies, small companies, universities, hackers, the best performing algorithm could do 75% correct. 25% error. So I don't know about you, but I don't want to be sleeping in the back of the car of a driverless car that gets it right 75% of the time. <laughs> we really need more than that. Now, 75% of the time is 75% is, uh, success is good enough for winning world champion in chess and go. It's good enough for the weather. It's even good enough for the stock market. But 75% is not good enough for driving a car. And this is one of the big challenges of AI entering the real world. The real world is much less forgiving. It's good, 75% is good enough when you're predicting what product you're gonna buy or what, what, what song you're gonna like. So uh, the next uh, year comes along, 2011, the best performing, best performing software gets it right 75% and a half, <laughs> all right? So this is like half a percent is a big deal in computer science and everybody's uh, celebrating and they're locking down their code and they're doing all kind of licensing agreements and it's in a big hurrah. By the way, humans can classify these things at 95% correct. That's the level of performance of a human. 2012 comes along, submissions begin to pour in again around 25% error. September 30, midnight comes along, a new submission comes in, and it brings down the error to 15%. Now, that might not sound like a big deal to you, but that's a, such a, uh, that's such a big jump in this area that, that it was like for it was for the community like seeing Jesus. It was, some, it was an incredible moment that everybody stopped what they're doing. The crowd cheered. No, there wasn't a crowd. It was a server in some God-forsaken place. But if, there, if, it was, if the servers could, could uh, brace themselves, they would. It was a, an incredible moment. Not only did they bring down the error to 15% using a fundamentally new algorithm, which we now call deep learning, but they also open-sourced their code. The next year, everybody copied it, and nobody dared do it without this code, and it, error came down to less than 10%. Remember, human performance is 5% error. 2014, it goes down almost to 5%. 2015, it gets closer. It goes down to 3.5%. 2016, just a few months ago, it went down to 2.9%. So today, computers can understand images better than the average human. That was, that was just a few years ago impossible beyond any, any, any dream of any AI researcher. It's suddenly here. So that means, now embarrassingly, behind the scenes, it's the same algorithm that this guy used back in 57, except that he didn't have data and didn't have computing power. So this is a neural network of one layer. Today there are 100 layers. Some networks have 1,000 layers. This is why it's called deep learning, because it has all these layers, but behind the scenes, Roughly the same architecture, just applied many, many layers deep, and it allows computers to understand what they see. So it's an incredible thing, and I can tell you, now a computer can look at an image like that and say, hey, there's a dog, a human, a chair, and another chair, right there. Uh, and uh, when we see this in the lab, and remember, you know, a computer can do this using an, a photo, but a computer is not limited to just seeing in three colors like we do, with two eyes. A computer can be connected to uh, 12 cameras. It can see in a broader range of the spectrum, in a higher frame rate, in the dark, far away. So a lot of people will ask me, you know, will a computer ever be able to appreciate the sunset or something like that? And the truth is that AI will be able to perceive the world in such a greater richness than we humans because AI will have so many more sensors than we can that it will actually won't be able even to explain, it will be like explaining to a blind person the nature of color. This is how, this is where perception is going and this is one of the, the issues that we're going to have to confront. And so uh, when you look at driverless cars, for example, you might wonder why are we hearing driver, about driverless cars today? After all, they've been, uh, people have been wanting to build these cars for a long time. 
we've always been able to control a car from a computer. We've been able to find the shortest path from New York to DC with traffic, without traffic. So what's the problem? Why is it taking so long? It's taking so long because we couldn't figure out the small issue of, uh, for example, differentiating between a pothole and a shadow. It's a tiny thing. But if you're driving at 80 miles an hour, it's really important between a plastic bag and a rock. They look the same, but if you miscalculate, it could be disastrous. The difference between a toddler and a fire hydrant, right? They look, they look pretty sim similar if you're not sophisticated enough, but we drive very differently next to a toddler on the side of the road than next to a fire hydrant. And up until a few years ago, maybe a year or two ago, computers could not tell the difference, and they, that was why they could drive across the desert, but they couldn't cross the Manhattan intersection. Couldn't tell the difference between a bicycle and a motorcycle. These things are important when you're driving a car, and that element of perception didn't exist until a few years ago. So now, cars can do this, and they can do this better than humans. They can see in the dark and the rain. They, can, uh, they get better and better over time, unlike humans that at best remain constant in performance. So, the implications of this are far-reaching, and just to give an example of driverless cars, we tend to think of driverless cars, okay, they're gonna be taxi cabs with no driver, but really, it's a whole ripple effect on the economy, on the way we ship goods and so forth. Uh, we've developed uh, drones that fly over cornfields and look at each and every leaf and can find these minute signals of a disease, and they can do that better than experts. So imagine what that does to agriculture and to the, you know, avoiding the use of pesticide. Um, you see robots working in factories side by side next to humans for the first time because the robots can see the humans and understand what the humans are going to do. This is a revolution in manufacturing because of perception. The list goes on, and what's really interesting is that this technology is open source. Anybody can use it. In fact, we have kids showing up after high, from high school, in the afternoon, they can put together a system that would get them a PhD just a few years ago. Uh, it raises the bar for everybody, but it also is alarming in terms of how and who uses this technology. But don't get it wrong, the, the software is open source, but the data isn't. And you'll see Google and Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft all have their open source systems, but good luck getting the data used to train these systems from Google, for example. So, uh, remember, data is the fuel, and that now is the new asset that allows these things to grow. This is sort of what, what is behind the scenes. So the last piece of the puzzle is the cloud. And what I mean uh, by the cloud is not that you upload music or offload computation, but the idea is that machines train machines. So whereas a human driver can have at most one lifetime of experience of driving, a driverless car can have many lifetimes of experience of driving because it learns from all other driverless cars all the time. So if one driverless car experiences something, it shares that with all driverless cars. So very quickly they learn and they learn from each other. But AI can also challenge AI and make it learn even faster in a little bit of a sort of predator-prey kind of relationship or maybe professor-student kind of relationship, right? So you have two things challenging each other. And I'm gonna give you one example that I find fascinating. This is called, uh, you know, learning, teaching a computer how to speak, you know, how to voice synthesis. You hear these computer voices and, you know, every GPS jill, right? So somebody spent career trying to get voice synthesis to sound like a human, right? So here's a new system, and the way it works is that the computer learns how to speak, as a human, and one AI, but there are two AIs, and there's another AI that listens and says, uh-uh, you're a computer, I can tell, you're not a human. And they go back and forth, and one system tries to speak like a human, and another AI system tries to discriminate between a real voice of a human, which it, it has examples of, and that artificial system. But they can go back a gazillion times a second, having these conversations, and at the end, the computer learns how to speak in a way that's indistinguishable for humans. So let's take a listen to this computer learning to speak in English. Aspects of the sublime in English poetry and painting, 1770 to 1850. So that's a snippet of uh, computer speaking, um, but it learned not because somebody programmed how to do voice synthesis, but it learned from example by, by targeting another AI. 
Here's another example. Since you can do this in English, you can do this in any language. You can do this in Chinese. And、uh, let's hear what that sounds like. 有众多小运河通过该镇，码头边种树环绕。So I don't speak Chinese. This sounds pretty good to me. But、uh, when I ask my、uh, Chinese students, they will tell me, "Yeah, we can tell this is a computer generated, but it's better than any synthesized Chinese we've ever heard." Now, of course, once a computer can learn how to speak, they can learn how to speak like you.、Uh, they can learn to speak uh, like uh, Donald Trump. They can learn to speak like anybody. Right? There's no, there's,、uh, you can't even tell who said what once the systems、uh, get loose. In fact,、uh, you can、uh, have the computer speak like a human in a random language. Here's a computer trying to make up a language that sounds like a human. It's, it's, it's、uh, fascinating. Sun, it was better to say yeah. He was still German, but in the book, in the situality, Gerald didn't have any technical capability at all. I'm pretty, I'm twice. You know, whenever I hear this, I'm worried somebody in the crowd is going to say, "Actually, that's、uh, Finnish." <laughs> and、uh, well, so I don't think it's any language, but it sounds like a la- it sounds like sort of Estonian or something. So it's really、uh, it, it's it's so human. It has the breath, it has the intonation, it has the emotion. So you know, future robots aren't going to have a, an evil Darth Vader voice. They're going to have they're going to speak like your grand your grandmother, right? They're going to have a sweet voice. Uh, that's indistinguishable for human, and this is all through machine learning and sort of made obsolete all the voice synthesis community in in one shot.、Uh, you can also have computers learn how to, for example, not speak uh, like uh, human, but actually generate music.、Uh, so here, computers learning both to make sound like a、uh, piano, but also、uh, and put that together to make a piano concerto. Let's let's take a listen. Okay, that's pretty good.、Uh, that's、uh, better than anything I could compose, and, and when most people could compose. It's it's pretty amazing to see computers being able to generate these things. Computers can generate、uh, images. These are faces of people that don't exist, but they were generated by a computer. We saw lots of people and say, "Okay, I get it. I can generate portraits. I can generate bedrooms." This is our bedrooms that don't exist were generated by a computer based on lots of things it saw. So I want to conclude with this sort of uh, uh, bigger picture of, of where AI has been and where it's going. And I, I see these six phases of artificial intelligence, six waves or six levels, if you like. And the first level that took 40 years for AI to go through is the symbolic age, and that's the idea that you write programs by writing rules and logic and And the computer sifts through the logic and looks forward through search and can find the right kind of、uh, solution. So that took 40 years to go through that. The next 20 years, starting in about the 90s, are is called data mining, data analytics. The idea that you take well tabulated data, big and huge spreadsheets, and you make predictions, stock market,、uh, weather, all these different areas, the retail, where you have a lot of data. It's very Organized very nicely. You take that data and you make predictions. So, so that's predictive analytics. That's been around for 20 years. It's doing very, very well, and it's good for certain applications. But that incredible technology couldn't solve this problem, which any first, any one-year-old child can do, which is perception. So, the third level,、uh, which we're sort of in the middle of now, maybe started uh, 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 this decade, is what we call cognitive computing. It's the ability to understand. Unstructured data like images, voice, text,、um, sound, video, these kinds of things that are very、uh, difficult to do. Computers can now can look at a face of a human, understand their emotion better than the average human.、Uh, so, so really, do things that that we thought would never be possible in all these new business applications that have to do with computers understanding what's happening in the real world. So, what are the next three levels? This is sort of where we are now. What's going to happen in the future? So, here are some predictions.、Um, the, the sort of fourth wave, which we're sort of beginning to see now, are what we call curious and creative machines. So, these are machines that don't just take data, as in the first three waves, and reach a conclusion, buy or sell, turn left or turn right,、uh, but they actually generate new stuff. So, we have、uh, they ask questions. And they generate new things. This is a 
software program we wrote that looks, does experiments, comes up with hypotheses, creates new rules, new discovers, rediscovers physics. It's now, there are hundreds of papers that were gen, whose main result was generated by this, what we call robotic science. These robots that design experiments and do them. Uh, they also create new things. This is a robot designed by an AI. It wasn't designed by human, it has this odd shape, but it works pretty well. Designed by human. You can design everything. Uh, in engineering school, uh, you know, these are electronic circuits. In, in, uh, in engineering, we think this is a very creative thing to design. And it uh, is very difficult to design. And a lot of people who uh, don't know how to design this, but computers are learning to do it better than people. They're even getting patents for their designs. But not just things like that, even art. Uh, and I'll t uh, in this uh, museum, I like to show this example of a robot that uh, uh, paints. And the early paintings weren't that good. It uh, sort of dabbled with paint like a child. But it's getting uh, to the point now where it's not Picasso but it's better than the average human can paint. Right? These are all oil on canvas paintings, large and small, uh, some sort of reinterpretation of existing things, but they're all, the computer is getting better all the time in generating uh, paintings. The fifth uh, level is uh, what we call self-awareness. This is, uh, we talked about cognition in the series. It's uh, all about, taking all this AI, and instead of having computers learn about the world, they turn it inside and learn about themselves. So we have a couple of interesting robots in the lab. This is one of them. This is a blind robot. It can't see or sense anything about the world, but all of its sensors are about itself. It, it can sense itself, its stresses, its angle, its, its mortar joints, all of it. When it touches the ground, it can sense uh, itself, and it uses that to create a self-image. And so the robot, after, in a period of about four days, it begins to create a model of itself. This is the beginning. You can see the self-image is pretty crude. It's a stick figure that looks nothing like the real robot. Two days into the process, it's beginning to realize it has four legs, but doesn't quite know how they're connected and where they are. And this is about uh, four days into the process, it figured out that it has four legs. This is a very crude self-image is created of itself. It then uses that self-image to figure out how to walk in its imagination. Using its, the self-image is created of itself. Uh, and here it is walking in reality. I have to say we were hoping to get an evil spidery walk, but instead we got this lame way of moving forward. And when you look at this robot, you have to remember that it had no clue what it looked like to begin with, nor did it do trials of walking, nor was it programmed. But it learned by creating a self-image. And check this, we did something very cruel. We did something very cruel, we chopped off a leg and we watched what happened. And uh, we can see that within about a day, the robot's self-image also loses a leg. And it learns how to walk here without the leg. I know it's very sad. But we did, we did, we did put the leg back on, and the robot is happily retired. Right? So, but the robot here learns how to walk without the leg. And it does so not because there's a sensor that said leg came off, switch to plan B. But it's because the dynamics came All right. So what's the fifth, the sixth, and final level? And I'll leave you with this thought experiment. It's when AI is good enough that it's not generating art and robots. It's generating the next generation of itself. And that's why it's the last level. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. We're now going to move on to the, the, the second act here. Uh, I think we're going to put some chairs out on, on stage, and uh, we're going to bring up two more guests and have a, a discussion based for, off of Hod's talk. So let me, while the chairs are being put in place, let me tell you who else is going to be on stage. Very lucky tonight to have Susan Schneider, who is a philosophy professor specializing in the nature of the self and mind. 
Uh, she works at the University of Connecticut. She is part of our Y House community. She is also um, a, a spends time at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. And you may well have read some of her articles written for a general audience. She's written some wonderful pieces recently for the magazine Nautilus. And we also have Ed Turner. Ed is a, a co-founder of Y House and a professor of astrophysical science at Princeton University. He's also an affiliate scientist at the University of Tokyo's Kavli Institute for the Physics and Mathematics of the Universe. And in particular, I want to mention that Ed is an active participant from the outset in the Breakthrough Starshot Initiative, which if you haven't heard about, is a billionaire's idea of how to take us to other stars, to take us through interstellar space. So if you would join me in welcoming both Susan and Ed on stage, and we'll bring Hod back up, and I'm going to try to interrogate and begin a, a, a conversation amongst us all. Thank you. You guys, yes, Susan, let me sit there, and I'll, I'll lurk off to the side here because my, my role is somewhat uh, peripheral. Uh, wow. <laughs> so I guess um, maybe just to start, start this off a little bit, I'll throw this question out to, to all of you and first one to jump in. I mean, one thing that struck me listening to your talk was I started to think, well, are we on the cusp and perhaps it's already happened, are we on the cusp of machines that understand the world better than we do? Is that a fair statement to make? Are we approaching that point or have we already gone past it? Maybe Susan, do you want to try that? Oh boy. Um, I'm not sure if machines will be conscious or have experience, um, but I think we are getting closer and closer to artificial general intelligence, so intelligence that's flexible and capable of pulling together various bits of information from different domains. So driving a car as well as excelling at chess, making breakfast without burning the house down, all of that. What is it to understand? Um, that's a rich, deep philosophical question. To understand, do you have to really feel? So that I'm not so sure about. I'm not sure whether or not they'll really be conscious machines. So. Um, well, I would echo the idea that it depends a bit on what you mean by understand. If you have a, a goal, machines are already have a better understanding in the pursuit of some goals, not in the pursuit of all goals. Uh, what I th think we haven't seen an example of yet, or even a, an extrapolation of current trends to machines that choose goals, which is one top put of, of understanding. You know, what, what would you like to happen? Or what would you like to do? What would you want to do? What would be good or bad? Uh, those reflect a, a different sort of understanding. Mm. So maybe, so hard, you're, you're poor robot trying to learn about itself and crawl along. Um, was it given the impetus to try to move? It was, yes, it was given the impetus to, to uh, try to move uh, very much like we are given impetuses to do all kinds of things. Uh, and, uh, and not uh, un, unsimilar to the, the way that uh, you know, a rat uh, is looking for food uh, and we look for whatever we're looking for. Uh, and we find ways to do it. So I think it's sort of <laughs> fundamentally very similar. And of course, uh, you know, we're miles uh, away from having anything similar to human uh, level. But I think it's very similar. And I would echo this idea that we don't know what understanding is. I mean, I, I was just this morning at uh, PhD defense, and I struggled with this question. How do you tell if somebody really understands something, or they're just echoing uh, results? <laughs> and there is, there, you know what? There is no way to know. The only way we know in academia, if somebody understands something, is by testing. And so you can test these AI systems, and that's, I think, philo theoretically, the, the limits of knowing if somebody or, any, or something understands anything. Mm -hmm. It's only by testing. Because I think one Prediction. of the shocking things as well that you, you showed was actually when you play those little sound 
clips of the, the AI that had learned to speak like a human. So can a machine mimic a person so well, and yet there's nothing there? I mean, I know in philosophy, there's a, perhaps you talk about the, the zombie idea <laughs> in philosophy. Um, is that relevant here? Susan? So, um, yeah, definitely. I mean, if you have, for example, consider the Japanese androids. Um, you know, right now there are um, androids that are being built for elder care in Japan, and they are being built to look very human. Of course, there are issues like uncanniness that they need to get beyond to make human-like robots, but obviously one big challenge is to get them to behave as humans do. And you can envision, say, 10, 20 years into the future, that they start to act convincingly as if they really feel. At what point do they feel? At what point are they more like Rachel in Blade Runner, who, as depicted in that film, truly felt? I mean, how would we find out? Um, you know, one way, as Hod just mentioned, is to devise tests. So. It seems maybe this leads to the probably a really contentious question, at least I hope it is, and get you guys talking about it. Um, the ability to um, pretend to cheat, to um, trick you into, you know, if I pick up the telephone and Donald Trump is on the other end, and I can't tell whether or not it's the, <laughs> the real thing. Later. Um, but the, this, this ability... <laughs> you know, where are the dangers, and are we heading towards a, a dystopia in the future? Are we heading towards a wonderful future? Are AIs going to be a threat to us? Are they going to be a, a, a beautiful extension of us? I mean, this, this is a big, contentious question. So maybe, maybe we should just go through everyone and see what your opinion is on that. Um, well, there's a, there's a lot of clever people worrying about you know, the threat of AIs and singularities and, and you know, super intelligent machines that are smarter than we are outdoing us. And the more powerful a technology is just historically, you know, the more harm and the more good it can do. I would say overall technologies have helped us more than they've hurt us. And I would, I'm fairly optimistic. I think AI will too. But, but all of these technologies, like driverless cars, would make great car bombers, wouldn't they? You don't need a martyr, um, you know. Uh, again, it comes down to the idea of purpose. We kind of are assuming that you would want your driverless cars to drive safely, but if you give three-year-old three toy cars, they like to bang them into each other uh, because that's fun and exciting and so on. Or if you watch a, a you know one of those Fast and Something movies, I don't know, but, you know. So I think. Uh, the threat of AI will come a lot down to who controls its goals and purposes. Hold. Oh, yeah. what, what do you think? About so this? you know, the way I, I I think it boils down to, the the risk is not what AI will do to people, but what people will do to people using AI. That is a a, a much higher priority threat, and I, you can already enumerate, and I don't want to do enumerate all the different ways in which AI can be used. But even in driverless cars, this, uh, um, you know, I just uh, recently realized that they can be uh, a sort of a new form of censorship, for example. You can uh, imagine a world where you drive from A to B in a driverless car and you, somebody makes sure that you never get to see a certain part of the city. No matter where you go, you never cross that part of the city. It's not on your maps, you're never in there unless you walk off the grid you never see that part of the city. And you can imagine, uh, uh, maybe not in New York, but in other, the rest of the planet, there are places you can't get to unless you're in a car. So that could be a pretty, uh, I, I'm sure that's gonna happen, all right? So that's a, an example of how people can, can use AI to do all kinds of things that we can't uh, even imagine today. So that to me is the risk. It's not uh, this uh, dystopian world in a thousand years where Arnold Schwarzenegger robots are shooting people <laughs> in the street, but really what people will do to people with AI in the next decade, and this is where things are heading. Susan? Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about um, technological unemployment, because look at all the cab drivers, Uber drivers, right. bus drivers. I mean, something like 6% of the economy right, drives. Right. Um, 
you know, but also to respond to um, your concern that really humans are what's dangerous here, how they control the AIs. To go back to your talk, though, I mean, the point you left us with at the very end is machines creating machines. So there's a big concern right now in the media and within academe about what's called super intelligent AI. AI that is a special kind of artificial general intelligence that is smarter than humans in every way possible. And we can kind of see how, at least in perceptual domains, we might be able to get to that point even if we're not as smart as the machines. So once these machines run their self-improving algorithms, they can change the goals that we put in them. So no matter how benevolent we may be right. or how evil we may be, they can end up manipulating their own goals and they could be the end of humanity. So, you know, Stephen Hawking, Elon right. Musk, and others have been making a lot of pronouncements on this issue. So I think we have to consider both sides of the equation here with AI, the technological unemployment, more practical issues that are very, very serious, but also the grave existential risk that intelligence poses when it's not, you know, of the, the form we have. So, so we're sort of arguing about what end is going to come first. <laughs> humans blowing up the planet using AI or AI blowing up humans. And so oh. these are the two options. Yeah, I try not to think about it too much. <laughs> right? so, uh, yeah. But it could also go well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And none of this will happen in the next 50 years, right? So everybody relax. <laughs> Even then it comes down to how, suppose we had machines that chose their own goals, how would they evaluate those goals? I, I, I think yeah. as good a guess as anything is they would be, you know, in an existential crisis. They'd just turn themselves <laughs> off. Why do anything? What, what, what purpose would they have? <laughs> well, they, 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 it's true that the one uh, saving grace is the more sophisticated the machine is, the more challenges, the more it can, it can get depressed. It can. It has the real, real issues. It's not all uh, sort of computation, and mm -hmm. it's it's complex. It can make the wrong decisions. It can uh, um, have emotions that uh, you know. So, so it's not going to be an easy ride for the AI either. Yes. Like Hal in two thousand one. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I guess that also stems from. I mean, you gave beautiful example of the self-driving, original self-driving car experiments, where it's the complexity of the real world that is the thing it's got to figure out how right to now, deal right. with. We did do one experiment where we were breeding um, robots in simulation, and we left them without a goal. So we didn't say, let's breed robots that can move fast or something like that. We just said, we just left it with zero goals. And something very interesting happened. Uh, the sort of default goal was self-replication. Uh, so uh, now it's not because machines wanted to self-replicate, but machines that did self-replicate by chance, there were more of them. And so by the time you came back, you know, a couple of weeks later, the, the place was crawling, this virtual place was crawling <laughs> with machines that could pick apart other machines and build copies on themselves. Uh, so, and this is the statistics of life and uh, yeah. And that's what that's you get when you have no goal. And arguably, that's what we are. <laughs> I mean, in certain sense, evolution is yeah. tautological. What persists, persists. So. Yes, exactly. So, so that's what you get with no goals. <laughs> well. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll open up to some questions from the audience. I know that we have microphones that will come around um, so if you raise your hand and I'll point to you and if you wait for the mic to appear and you can direct your questions at, at our panel over, over there to start with and then, then over there. It's been my understanding that you can divide very generally scientists into two different groups. One are the good scientists who do the sort of, uh, not the grunt work, but the, the work with the equations, and they'll go from A to B to C. And then there are the great scientists like Einstein who suddenly see the answer, and then they'll go to their assistants and say, this is the answer, this is the question, 
derive it for me. Um, I have a, a question. This concept I'd like to be discussed by all three of you uh, with respect to the AI. And also, my impression is that this artificial intelligence that keeps developing, whether it's the conscious intelligence or not, it seems to develop not through an understanding, but just a trial of hundreds of billions and billions and trillions of experiences that the robot tries out, and it throws out all the ones that don't work and the ones that give a slight improvement it'll take and then try to improve on that, and it just keeps going. So those are the two things I would like to be here discussed by so, the group. So for your question about, well, could, could a robot be an Einstein? Can it discover things like that? Uh, not yet, but again, neither are most of us, right? So it's a pretty high bar that you set there. Uh, most scientists don't work like that, and it, it's already pretty impressive if, if a robot can, can uh, discover things that, that normal scientists do. But will it uh, be able to do something like this? Uh, maybe. I mean, when, when you look at these huge neural networks, these deep networks that, that uh, create understanding, it, it looks from the outside a little bit like this, this uh, what you're describing. It, it comes up with something we can't understand why. <coughs> It finds a truth, and then we can go back and, and we can sort of back out why that is true. We can back out how the machine tells the difference between a fire hydrant and a child. We can back it out, but the machine comes up with this thing in some crazy way that we can't explain. So it has this flavor of what you're describing, but it's not the same thing. So that's as close as we can get. But again, it's a very high bar, so if we're already there, if that's the last frontier, can it be an Einstein? I think it's, it's pretty, pretty, already pretty um, challenging. Uh, and what was your second question? Um, I guess you covered both. <laughs> <laughs> but I, actually, I mean, I was coming to the thought that maybe an Einstein would be a pure consciousness coming to Yeah, we, well, we don't, I mean, you can speak to that. We don't know what goes on in the brain of an Einstein. It could be a gazillion calculations of some kind also. I don't think he knows either. He doesn't know, and nobody knows. So it looks like he just wakes up and has an idea. But uh, behind the scenes, who knows what's going on inside. Hey, did you want to say something? Um, well, I, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. These great flashes of insight are not conscious you know, if you ask how someone did this calculation, calculated the orbit of Mercury or something, you know, you can, they can explain how they did that. If you want to know how someone had the idea of general relativity, it just came to them, and we, we don't know how that works. And it's always harder to make uh, AI do something that we can do and we don't know how we do it. That's why, you know, recognizing the images, you don't know how you tell the difference between a dog and a cat. You just you just do. You know how you play chess, so that's an easier, an easier problem. A, a sort of related question, though, to go to the other end, the low bar. Children, when they learn from images, learn to learn. That is to say, once you've caught, taught them dog and cat and cow, they get pig and goat and you know snake like that because they've sort of generalized right. how to classify animals. Do the deep learning algorithms do that, or do? Or if you add a new yeah. animal, they need another thousand. No, no, images. absolutely. There is this thing called transfer learning, which is exactly this idea that the, okay. transfer learning. Uh -huh. So once the system learns a lot of uh, sees dogs and cats and so forth, it can do pigs a lot more easily because it's created this ability uh, to have sensations or qualia that have to do with understanding Animal. animals. Mm -hmm. They understand fur. They understand mm -hmm. eyes. Uh, it's not something you can sort of read inside, but they understand that, and that those building blocks allow them to recognize other animals more easily, and the, the level of transfer between domains is fascinating. You can have, we've seen that, you know, machines that learn to, um, um, cats and dogs can recognize disease, yeah. diseases in, in skin cancer more easily because they train on, on cats and dogs and pigs. So there's a lot of interesting things going behind the scene, and I think that's how humans learn as well. And that might be connected to 
Einstein. He's, there, you know, there's un, this less than obvious connection right. between knowing one. There's another question with the mic, and then, yes, go ahead. Uh, great presentation and conversation, thank you. Um, two questions, one drier than the other. What are you seeing in the cost of data and algorithms and the concentration of those assets across entities, whether corporate or governmental? And then, just real quick, it seems like we're teaching robots to do the Turing test on us, and you're talking about happily retiring them on the other hand. So just wondering like, where ethics are going. Thank you. Well, I could definitely, you know, the concentration of data is, is something that uh, does concern it's sort of the new, the new, uh, it's the new asset is data, and companies are hoarding the data, and companies that have uh, data can do a lot more than companies who don't have data, and, and for people who don't have data. So that's a, it's an issue, it's almost data monopoly. It's sort of something we'll have to think about. Uh, and, uh, and so the, that's all I can say. I mean, it's an issue with no solution right now. And most, it's sort of uh, below the radar for most legislators that are not seeing this accumulation of data and how it's fueling these incredible AI systems. Uh, and I didn't understand the second question. Just that robots are doing the Turing test to humans all the time, so we're teaching them how to feel. And I was just wondering, you know, we're talking about happily retiring robots that know how to feel, so I was just wondering, like, what are people thinking about ethics? Oh, about robot ethics. ethics. Want to take that one? Oh boy. Well, Ed and I are working on tests for machine consciousness. So I think we're at some point we're going to need to figure out whether the machine that is, say, helping clean up a nuclear reactor is being sent to something like its death because it's capable of suffering. I mean, we certainly don't want to create a slave class. Um, so we have to figure out whether it feels like anything to be them. We have to watch out. I mean. You know, we, here we're using very freely expressions like self-aware. And, you know, for me, as a philosopher, when you use the expression aware, that implies that it feels like something to be them. And that's something that we still need to investigate. In fact, I gave a TED talk on this recently. I think there are a lot of nuances here that we need to consider. Another thing in ethics, which I really wanted to bring up, um, because, you know, he went through so wonderfully these six different steps in AI, just Yesterday, Elon Musk announced the beginning of a new company, Neuralink, which is bringing AI into the brain. We have to remember, ethically speaking, that you know, when we watch science fiction, I mean, a lot of us right now may be watching humans in Westworld. That's a case where AI is all around us, but we remain unchanged. In reality, AI is not just going to transform the world, it's going to transform us. So ask yourself this, how comfortable would you be with a neural implant given that your computer gets hacked all the time? Are you ready to worry about dangers of being hacked? I mean, we're worried here about the abuses of self-driving cars. As AI goes in the heads, there are going to be a whole host of new ethical issues. There was a question over there. Yeah. Um, you touched on the way that improving technology is very disruptive for the economy. Um, it seems like we've already been seeing examples of that with uh, a lot of working class people feeling left behind coming into the recent election. And I guess Trump tapped into the anger. He, he created scapegoats for immigrants and global trade deals, but really isn't technology probably more likely responsible for what's happening with lower skilled, less educated people? And if that's the case, how do we solve this problem if it's only going to get worse? That's a really good question, and nobody has the answer. Uh, it's, uh, I think it's uh, definitely happening. You're absolutely right. I, I totally subscribe to that. The technology is the culprit behind a lot of unemployment. Um, and uh, we have to address it. Uh, in, it. It requires policy changes that are fundamental to the way we distribute less, uh, wealth, to the way we concentrate power, all these different things we have to sort of Rethink, and there are a lot of people thinking about uh, these things. You may have heard the uh, the idea of ubic of uh, universal basic income. That means that everybody gets. Uh, there's going to be a lot of productivity with all this AI, but not a lot of jobs. So how do we distribute the wealth so that everybody can participate in this abundance, uh, and also maintain a free market where if you have a new idea, you can sell it to, to anybody. So 
there's, uh, there's, we need some new thinking around policy. Uh, and that's, uh, as, that's harder than a technical challenge, really. So, so that's where it is. And, and you know, there's no simple answer to that. But in the case of driverless cars, I have to point out that there actually might still be a lot of jobs. And you did mention that a lot of uh, drivers will lose their jobs. But we will have many more cars made and bought, contrary to, to many predictions. So a lot more manufacturing jobs, a lot more ro road maintenance jobs, a lot more car mechanic jobs. So there's going to be a lot more jobs because of driverless cars. But in general, you're absolutely right. Technology is eating away jobs, and we have to solve it somehow. I, on that, I would say there's long been a balance. You know, the, the way our economy works is you contribute something and you are allowed to consume some resources that's somehow connected to what you contribute, not always in a very logical way, but, but you know, those are the two sides of the balance. And it may be that that whole approach will break down eventually, but that, you know, you it will become absurd to, uh, you know, try to appropriate apportion the resources an individual has access to based on what they do, because you know everybody will there'll be enough resources for everybody to have something. So that's sort of the direction right. of these exactly. minimum incomes and things. But you can imagine money going away entirely. For example, that's it's only been around I don't know a few thousand years. There's no reason to stick with it for too long. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I see a lot of adults struggling with being curious and creative and self-aware. And as you're teaching machines to be curious, creative and self-aware, is there anything that you've learned in the process or that you're learning in the process that can be transferred to humans learning to be more curious, creative and self-aware? Thank you. Well, that's a fascinating question. Uh, and you know what? I haven't thought about that. Uh, it's, uh, it, this, right now, the, the intelligence is so different uh, than, uh, and it works through these you know, gazillion backs and forth that humans can't do. So it's, it's learning in an alien way. It's being creative yeah. and, and curious in a way that is not similar <coughs> to the way hum, humans learn, at least on the surface. So there's, I don't see a lot of similarities, but what you can do is uh, think about ways in which you can use these AI systems to teach people. And so there's a lot of work in, on sort of uh, AI-based tutoring in a very sort of personalized, dedicated way where AI systems can teach children to learn things. That, that this is not far from, from uh, you know, a good teacher can do. But remember, not all teachers are above average. And uh, a lot of kids don't have teachers. Uh, so I think there's room for that. But uh, it's very difficult to, to transfer directly lessons learned from AI to people. Let's see. Um, so my first question is kind of related to the part you guys were talking about, about understanding. And that's the kind of the last step where when you develop understanding, you kind of develop feeling and emotion. And that's something that's way harder for us to even understand in ourselves as humans. Um, does that seem like the final step in which kind of the way AI would accelerate? And this is kind of a theme that I know it's probably going to come up because like, for instance, Elon Musk has said, like, what's the ch likelihood that we are AI in itself and we're all living in a simulation? And when you mentioned in your last uh, comment um, before taking the questions about the fact that, you know, don't worry, within 50 years, we won't have these crazy robots that are doing things of their own accord and setting their own goals. But so far in every graphs I've seen, like, an acceleration of some sort. What's your thought on kind of these robots creating their own understanding, creating their own emotions, understanding what emotions are, and then kind of the rest is kind of not controllable by us or not understandable by us because that's just kind of self-generating. Yeah, well, that's, that's I think what we or discussed earlier. It's definitely accelerating there. The question is, will we get there before humans abuse the technology in some other way. Uh, but it's definitely heading that way. I, I, you know, I mean, this, you know, probably we would disagree about f what, what are feelings to a machine. But I think it's definitely possible that machines will have feelings. Uh, they won't be necessarily similar to humans. 
But to me, and it's a very unromantic thing to say, but the feelings are nothing but predictions about mm. oneself. Uh, long term, short term, grave, happy, sad, but they're all about prediction of what's going to happen in the future. Uh, and uh, I think that machines are learning to do that, and to the extent that this is what em emotions are, uh, machines will have emotions of, of various kinds. They will be different, like animals have different emotions maybe than humans. Uh, and uh, we will not be able to understand those things necessarily. Where will that end? What's the end game? That's an open question. But I, I'm sure you have different opinions about machine emotions, but uh, it's sort of a, it's a pretty <laughs> open-ended area. Well, uh, I think it's, it's very important to keep track of what you know and what you don't know, and I, I think that's you know, where machines will go in the decades ahead in terms of things, I think, is, is, is something we don't know very well. All of these, these things are certainly possible. It might be worth mentioning that in the history of AI, going back to the 50s and 60s, there have been some false dawns, D-A-W-N, dawns, when, when the community expected the great leap forward to artificial general intelligence was 10 years away. I've, when I was an undergraduate, if you could imagine that, right around the time electricity was discovered. I, 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 I worked in Marvin Minsky, one of the great pioneers of uh, AI's lab in the late 60s, early 70s, and those folks thought they were 10 years right. from away. So just because we're exponentiating now doesn't necessarily mean we can extrapolate. That's only been going on for a few years. Uh, and one rule of extrapolating exponentials is don't extrapolate them for further longer than they've already been going on. <laughs> so uh, if it's been going on for the last three or four years, I would be, not that it's crazy to extrapolate longer, but you shouldn't be confident that yeah. it will go for more than another few years. And then, you know, we may hit another plateau for a while and then later something. So, right. uh, you know, I, I'm not sure if it's right around the corner or not. It could be. This time it's different. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we have time for one more question. Yep. I'm curious about this distinction between, for the driverless cars, between machine learning and programming. Because in your example, I can see how a machine can learn that that's a child and not a fire hydrant. But ha without having seen how a child acts, how does it know how to behave? Like, I don't have to see a child run out into the street a thousand times to sort of know that I should slow down if there's a, a five-year-old playing catch with his friends on, on the curb there. Um, but I would hope a machine isn't going to have that kind, it's not going to have that experience. Right. Is there some level of programming built into it that a human yeah. is deciding what oh, to yeah, do? Oh there's yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, programming in driverless cars. And I wasn't mean to say that it's only this thing, but this is the last piece of the puzzle. <clears throat> puzzle. All the programming how to behave when a ball, how to avoid a ball when you, when it, or a child when, it, when the child is on the street, or how to predict where a child is gonna go, that's, what to, uh, that's uh, easy. And that's been done a long time ago. But recognizing the child, that hasn't been solved until recently. And that was the last piece of the puzzle. Once you can recognize a child, a pedestrian, a bicycle, a motorcycle, the rest is relatively easy. And that's been solved a long time ago using programming exactly like you say, People uh, figured that out. So that was the last piece of the puzzle, and that's why it's taking off right now. But I, I, know, I know sort of machine actually say that's a child, but how does the machine, is a human saying, right, once you determine it's a child, here's what you need to do? Yeah, somebody already, somebody, somebody programmed all these different, which are fairly simple. Once you know what obstacles and where they're going and how to avoid them, uh, it, that's not, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's, that wasn't the thing that held back driverless cars. But it was the recognizing the things. That was the sort of last piece of the puzzle. So I think, <clears throat> I'm afraid we, we have to stop here, but I want to join you in thanking our panelists and our speaker, Hod. Thank you.